this video, we're going to be looking at types of instruction, types of practice, and when each of these are appropriate. Different types of instruction and practice work at different times in your learning journey. Some work best when you're in the cognitive stage of a skill, some work best when you're in the autonomous stage, some work best with simple skills, others with complex, etc. Today we're going to be breaking them down into types of instruction and types of practice. So let's take a look at them. Whole instruction is when the skill is taught as a whole and the athlete begins to appreciate the complete movement and execution of the skill. The whole method of instruction can sometimes mean that the athlete has to handle a whole bunch of movements at once. Advantages of this are, is that it's significantly quicker than other types of practice and the end movement is quite fluent. Disadvantages, however, is that by learning the skill all at once, there are larger numbers of errors which can be made, which may mean that it's harder to correct them all, and the learner might find it difficult to focus on lots of different things at once. In part instruction, this is when a, very, a skill is very complex and there's some sort of danger for an athlete perhaps, so it's, it's broken down into smaller parts. They can then be taught and linked together to develop the final skill. This is used when an athlete is demonstrating the whole skill um, so they can appreciate the whole product and understand how they will develop. So each part is, can be perfected individually, which is a positive, um, and the learner can grasp them a little bit easily, more easily. The disadvantages are that it takes a long time to perfect each part, and the skill may not be fluent when it is performed as a whole. Whole part whole instruction is when the skill is first performed as a whole, then split up into subroutines, and perfected and then practiced as a whole again. It's appropriate to situations when the performer has never tried the skill before, so they have to go at it as a whole at first, which gives the coach a chance to see what they may need to work on. Advantages of this are that uh, particularly weak areas of the skill can be isolated, and the performer can get a really rough grasp for the skill by attempting it first, so they sort of know how it feels. Disadvantages are that it takes a long time to learn the skill and then improve each one bit by bit and the end movement may not be fluent as all the parts are sort of put together and they don't flow as smoothly as you might like. No one method is suitable on all occasions and studies have shown that simple skills benefit from using the whole method, skills of medium difficulty benefit from using part method, closed skills are often best taught with part instruction and difficult skills are best dealt with by alternating between part and whole. Variable practice is when practicing a skill in a variety of different contexts and experiencing the full range of situations in which the technique or tactic might be developed. This allows both the development of a skill and the ability to adapt to a range of situations. This is vital for open skills. Group practice is best used for open skills and helps to build up a schema in order to use in game situations. Fixed practice is when a specific movement is practiced repeatedly, often referred to as a drill. This type of practice is ideal for skills that are always performed in the same way, like this gentleman kicking the ball. Fixed practice again is sometimes known as a drill, and again this type of practice is best with discrete or closed skills, like Andy Murray practicing his serving here. Not many variables are going to change. Messed and distributed practice. The organization of a practice session will depend greatly on those involved in the activity being practiced. Depending on the amount of experience, the skill level and the performance fitness, the practice may be organized in two ways. Mass practice is when the skill is practiced until learnt without taking a break. These sessions are good for athletes with high levels of fitness and experience and can be suited to fixed practice. Mass practice does not allow for breaks, for rest or for feedback. It's mostly appropriate for athletes who are in the autonomous stage of learning. Distributed practice. This is broken up with breaks and can either be used for rest or for feedback. These sessions are good for athletes with lower levels of fitness and low levels of experience and suited to variable practice. Here we can see the coach giving some feedback to the throwers and then they go back to throwing again. So again, this allows for breaks for rest or for feedback and is best for difficult, dangerous or fatiguing skills. Here we see Jamie Joseph. He's just let them do their little drill. Okay, now he's in there talking to them, giving some tips, giving them some feedback. Then they're able to go back and to implement his feedback and to try to put it into practice. Okay, this is a prime example of distributed practice. 
if it was mass practice, then they wouldn't be able to get that feedback from Jamie Joseph, and they'd just have to keep on using and learning the wrong technique. So what sort of practice and instruction is this then? As we can see, he, the batter in particular, he's using the entire um, batting stance, he's using the entire batting skill, so therefore it is whole instruction. It is fixed because it's coming from a bowling machine. If it was coming from a fielder, uh, from, a, from a range of bowlers, okay, it wouldn't be fixed. And it is mass practice as there isn't a coach there to give him feedback or to give him a rest. So hopefully that gives you some insight into the different types of instruction and the different types of practice. If you have any other questions, go and hit up your teacher. See you later guys.